What's happening, everybody? This is V3 Cast, episode number 20. One year's worth of V3 Cast. Congratulations, fellas. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Congratulations to you guys. We did it. We yeah. did it. That's right. They said we, we couldn't it do it. It's a year they later. Said, they all said we couldn't do it. Yes. We put your their face, dicks in the doubters. dirt. We said, we we'll fucking show you. How many hours of content is that? <laughs> 20 hours? Roughly. Yeah, something like that. Because some of yeah, them are under. Just under a full day. Some of them are under. Some of them are over. So yeah, you have a whole a whole day's worth of V3 cast if you, if you still want to binge it. Somehow saying yeah. 20 hours doesn't sound that impressive. I know, right? I, I like a year better. It's a long time, yeah. man. Imagine listening yeah. to us no, for 20 I was gonna hours. Say, yeah, I was going to say like 500 hours. But 20 is way less than 500. But right. one year, one year. That sounds decent. impressive. That's now, good. If, if you really want to have some impressive numbers, you got to change that shit to minutes, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> got to change yeah, the How many minutes up. is that? <laughs> so we have a fun show here um, for the 20th episode of V3Cast. But before we get into the show, what are y'all drinking? Keeping it simple today, I'll tell you. Coors Banquet, come on! Oh yeah, it's good. I feel like if you drink that because it it's says beer. Banquet, you'll be full after you drink that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and it's the it's the official beer of Cobra Kai. It's what uh, Johnny Lawrence is always drinking. So there you go, Steve. Go ahead, because I'm going to be the cherry on top of this segment. Okay, well, I got something from the old school, bringing it to this new school 20th episode. I know already. what it is. White Monster. Town Club Orange. Town are, you, are, Club. You, are you kidding me? Nice. That's where it's at. I haven't That's had awesome. one of these in forever. Oh, Where'd yeah, you find there? it? Uh, at this party store, like about a mile away. I, I just, I nice. stopped and I'm like, you know, sometimes these random party stores have really fun, obscure drinks that uh, you haven't seen in a while. And yeah. sure enough, they, they, they delivered. Coming on strong for the one year anniversary. How does it taste? Mm. Exactly the same. Good. It's awesome. That's now, good. It's, it's oh, good, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If they would have had cream soda type of thing, yeah. I would have done the mix. But you they mix didn't have that flavor. I you, did that with, um, you do that with Fago too, don't you? Yeah. Because um, those two flavors are, are um, more easy to find, but the town, yeah. the town club was limited. It only had like about five flavors. And um, I don't even actually know what they make. Yeah, I think uh, isn't soda. orange the best? Isn't orange the best? Yeah, that's why I grabbed orange. Yeah, thank you. Pretty much with anything Gatorade, with anything it, orange is, is is like a go to a safe orange a safe orange flavor. candy, the best. Is it orange, orange candy? For, I challenge. Uh, I challenge Aaron's assertion. What name an orange candy? What is an orange candy? <laughs> orange Jolly Ranchers are awesome. Orange yep. Starbursts oh are awesome. Yep. Orange Skittles are Skittles. Awesome. I yep. could new, name orange candy all night, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> but guess what? Orange is not the best flavor in any of those candies that you it just is. named. But it, it is, is not. Though. You can but ask it is. anyone. It's Listen, <laughs> you can't ask anyone, and anyone will tell you that orange is the best. Aaron, you're about to find out in the comments. No. I know that you, everybody you loves listed, red. Hold on. You listed Skittles, Starburst, yeah. and what's yes. the other one? Jolly Rancher? Jolly Rancher. All right. In the comments. Tell orange, Aaron that he, orange jelly orange beans is not too. dominant in any of those yeah. thumbs down. Pe Aaron. People tend to like cherry and strawberry. You know what? That's fine, Middle America. You can like what you like. <laughs> <laughs> orange pop is good though, but not orange candy. I don't. Orange know what candy is great, about. Greg. You take that shit right on back. <laughs> nope. I will not. I stand by it. <laughs> well, um, that must mean that Greg has an orange flavored beer that he's about to unveil or something. Now, an orange beer would be delicious. Right? Yes, it would. I like the orange slice that. floating in there? Or are you talking yes. about actually orange up in there? I don't know. Citrus, whatever. Hold on. Right. I'll be right back. Wait, what in the world? <laughs> Wait, where did Aaron go? This was not planned. Is he going to have two beverages? I don't know what he's doing. He's going to get some orange candy, probably. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, you that's want more of that tropical stuff. Here we go. This orange Voodoo Ranger Juice Force IPA. It's the most orange beer I've ever had. 
So I'm going to have that instead of the course tonight. Because oh, you already switch it up. You already wait. You already opened the course. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Maybe I'll drink both. I don't care. We'll see. We'll see how it hey, goes. This is the 20th episode. Let's get crazy. We're getting crazy. It's been one year, man. Anything goes tonight. That's right. What's your uh what's your pick, Greg? What's your beer? Well, I'm gonna I mean, I'm your, gonna, I'm gonna class this joint up All right. this week and really change it up. Oh my Prospero. god, what is that bottle? <laughs> Tequila. Oh wow. And I'm Whoa. and I'm doing a shot. Oh, <laughs> man. That, nice. that so just wait. like took the gold medal right there yeah, that of wins. every See, episode. This is a shot glass I got for my most recent birthday. Yeah. So here's to you guys in 20 episodes. Cheers. And everybody telling Aaron how he's wrong about orange candy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, All right. speaking of the 20th episode, the one year anniversary of V3Cast, we must must say thank you to everybody who watches the episodes, shares it, tells their friends, comments, likes, all that stuff, man. You guys really help us out. And it's really cool. We get a lot of feedback in our comments and sometimes in the email. So people are interacting with what we're talking about. So it's cool. It's like we're creating this nice community. We have people from all over the world, Australia, the UK, uh, United States, Canada, so uh, let's keep it going, man. Let's uh, keep talking about cool movies and film and comic books and Dungeons and Dragons and beers and whatever else we and find scores. fun. This will be the only episode where we talk about orange candy, <laughs> just for the record. Yes. <laughs> I mean, we it would be weird if we talked about it all the time, as great as it is. That's right. It's like, are these guys a band or are they candy makers? I'm not sure what's going on here. <laughs> so in uh, in celebration of the one year anniversary of V3Cast, we put together a fun little sizzle reel of some of our top fun moments from all the episodes. So uh, enjoy. Uh, it's a ninja movie from the 80s. And we were like, what? Yeah. Okay. We That's can handle best. that. Like it was like, <laughs> yeah, uh, we're going to do that. You know, if, if you told me it was a, a Western from the sixties, I would have been like, all right, we'll make it work. But the Ninja movie thing, you know, it was like right up our alley. That's our bread and butter. We grew up on that stuff. So these sunglasses I got in the mail, I don't know who they came from. I think it might've been one of our like people who watch the podcast or something. But I got these sunglasses just yesterday in the mail. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So I got sunglasses in the mail, too. And I didn't, I didn't order them. I don't even no, know where they came from. Either. I didn't order these. So it must be, uh, it must be a podcast people uh, sending it, right? So, so wait a minute. Somebody sending you guys sunglasses? I didn't get any. What the hell? What Jeez. in the... Bryce. Burn. What's going on here? What? What? I don't know what you're talking about. What's uh, going on here? Aaron? We've got two that can see. We played a show at the Cat House on one night, and then we had another show in Huntington Beach the very next night, and we didn't have a place to stay. So we, a lot of times, one of our missions was to try to find a, a fan that would let us crash <laughs> at their house. That was always a mission that we would do. But on this particular occasion, that didn't happen. So we ended up uh, just saying, oh, hell with it. We're just going to uh, crash in the van. We'll find like a strip mall or something like that and park in the parking lot um, and, and sleep there and get an early start and head off to Huntington Beach the next day. So we found this little strip mall not too far from the Sunset Strip and uh, we went to sleep. And uh, because we're not experienced West Coast people, we did not know that it's you know <laughs> super fucking hot in the in during the daytime there because it's basically desert, right? So uh when we woke up the next morning in the van, it was probably about 108 degrees in the van, and I thought I was gonna die. It was so hot and I was so thirsty. I couldn't even you can't even measure how incredibly hot and thirsty that I was. So I kind of staggered out of the van. And I was looking for any place that would sell anything to drink. I don't care what it was. I just needed to have something to drink. So 
there was and, and there was fresh blacktop on the parking lot at, at, at this uh strip mall so we were we, we could have died honestly um did we did we even crack the windows no open? i'll tell you oh, why we didn't do that because we didn't we thought somebody would like mess with us or something overnight or something like that or give somebody an opportunity to do bad stuff what i don't know why we didn't crack the windows but we did not so we were in this hot box <laughs> trying to kill ourselves basically so I staggered out of the van and found this like health food store. It was the only thing that was open. Um, so I, I, I meandered into this health food store and I'm like, they're not going to have anything for me to drink in here. So I'm looking around and they had, believe it or not, I know this might sound crazy, but in my very young years, Aaron, our aunt Judith would uh, juice carrots. If you recall back, back when she lived uh, in downtown Detroit at the, at the apartment <laughs> down there, the park Sheldon. And so I had carrot juice before in my <laughs> in my little kid years. <laughs> so so I went in there and I bought this humongous ice cold carrot juice. It probably it's probably like, you know, that tall, like however big a big Gatorade bottle is, right? And I drank that thing in one tilt. I just downed this carrot juice, and it was the most delicious thing I had ever had in my whole life. And I think it saved my life. So I I, I was so. I just cherished this drink as I was drinking because it was so hot. And then and then the clouds lifted and I felt like I was going to make it. And then sure, sure enough, we needed to do laundry really bad because we had been on the road for probably over a week at that point. And next door to the health food store was a laundromat. So we got to wash our clothes and I didn't die from heat stroke and it ended happily. But that was that's my crazy kooky one of many tour stories. It says, uh, hey guys, just wanted to share some local beer with you to enjoy on the podcast. I tried to see if there was any local microbrewing place doing ginger beer, but found nothing you can't get anywhere else. Keep making some kick-ass music, and hopefully we'll run into you at a convention in the near future. Thanks. The Found on Shelf podcast, Dustin and Patrick. Guys, man, Come thank on. you so much. So here's what we got. Are you ready? We got two different kind of beers. The first one we got is from Level Beer. It's called Game On. And I know you guys love that can. It is so cool. It's Super Mario Brothers all day long. And uh, let me look at that. Let me look at that. It's an Indian pale ale. Well, hey, Greg, I'll tell you what, man. Why don't you just take one? Are you ready? Here you go, man. Enjoy. All right. And then the this. other one we got. Game On. That's right. Is by. Hold on. Let's get the sound of me cracking. Yeah, there you ready? go. Crack that into the mic. Oh man, that's the you sound that? of success. I felt like you Cheers. cracked open two. Yeah, it sounded like. <laughs> All right, I hopefully, felt it. Hopefully, it's ice cold. Now oh, the yeah. other one, it's real cold, but it's from uh, Elysian Brewing, and it's called Altered Contact. What do you think about that? Look at that can, Aaron. Like this kind of like spoofing um, Altered State film. You should Let give that one, Aaron. That. Aaron give me one. Oh, you want one of these, man? Hand that to Aaron yeah. through the okay. screen. Here you go, man. Cool. Oh, yeah. Enjoy, man. Enjoy. It's great. Um, Let's so, see again, thanks super, super amount to uh, to uh, Found on the Shelf podcast. Dustin and Patrick, man. Yeah, that you was guys solid. rock. Super cool. Really appreciate it. It's got a great name, Mr. Blue Sky. You know, I love uh, electric. Oh, uh, Yeah. This is a Michigan, uh, Michigan wheat cherry wheat ale, and wait, it even has. That sounds wait, sophisticated. Detroit. Wait, stop right there. What does it have in it? Cherry, bro- brother. <laughs> cherry. <laughs> yeah. That was why. Well, that was why. I wait. did it when I when I got it. I was like, I'm going to show Greg that I can diversify a little bit. So there you go. I have not had that. It's from Griffin Claw. I just checked my phone, and indeed, hell has frozen over. <laughs> Aaron yeah. has a cherry beer. Yeah. <laughs> I do think that cherry is okay. Remember I was giving you my what? inconsistent. I gave you my inconsistent bullshit where I was like, some fruits are okay in a beer. <laughs> some are not. Cherry's okay, but banana is not. And Sorry, coffee is not. It is. Coffee's not. Wait, wait. I've you... never ever heard of a, in my whole life a beer that has banana in it. You're making that shit up. They they do it. Line and Kugels probably has it. <laughs> just to just all, to mess with me. All I know is Aaron's a hundred percent wrong about coffee and beer, especially stouts. He's a hundred percent wrong. <laughs> so I'm wrong that like, I don't like it. <laughs> you're wrong that it doesn't belong. 
you can like that's it. That's your statement that certain ingredients don't belong in beer. Isn't I that your? That was my statement. I think it was I my think statement. It was. I don't like it. We're going to have to go to the tapes. Yeah, Let's go to the tapes. Instant replay. <laughs> <laughs> what was Aaron's so, statement? Cherry's okay, <laughs> but banana is not. Coffee's not. Brazil was the movie in between Time Bandits and Baron Munchausen. Brazil's a great movie. Um, it's been a while since I've seen it, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go watch it again. But um, Cam, you said you, Steve, you said you would see Brazil. You haven't seen it yet. Yeah, I've never seen that one. It was and totally I don't think Cam, him. I don't think Cam believed you. I don't think he believed you. Really? So I'm setting. Yeah, he said <laughs> something about. He was quoting a movie, I think, and he said like. He said, uh, I, I, I don't want to see it and I won't see it. You can't make me or something like that. It sounded like it was something from a movie. Either way. Oh, no, no, no. You know what that was from? He, he was that? saying about the swamps of sadness and what happened. We were saying we don't want to say it. And he was saying, say it, say it. I'm not going to see it. That's what that was. Right. But that, no, yeah. I have not seen. No, there is a chance that if I start watching Brazil, I might go, oh, wait a minute. I've seen that. But I don't think I have. I don't. I don't well, think I've seen I'm it. laying it out for you: the Cam Floyd challenge. All right. That if you don't watch <laughs> Brazil before the next podcast, I get to beat your ass. All right. I, I'm gonna be in trouble. <laughs> Just like when we were kids, and I used to beat you up all over the place. <laughs> you were so, only about eight inches taller than me, and I used to <laughs> settle down, Aaron. <laughs> um. You know, feel free to edit these if I talk about them too much. I try to keep it brief, but um, you can't the help other yourself. one, I know I can't help it. I'm loquacious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that should be in the credits. <laughs> well, that's some of our favorite moments from the past year of V3 Cast. If you have a favorite moment, leave it in the comments. And uh, any suggestions for future episodes, we're always open to that too. So uh, hit us up. Ask v3cast at gmail.com or the comments in the video. I'm going to call an audible right now. I have a brand new segment that I just thought of. Oh, just a man. Ago. And even you guys don't know what this segment is. It's brand new. And uh, I think that it has a future. I think that with something we can do, we can all I'm participate. A little worried. This right. is called collecting cool stuff. Okay. Because we all three collect all kinds of cool stuff, a variety of all kinds of things. So okay. this is something okay. I've been obsessed with lately and I've gotten, I don't know, I think 20 of them or something, uh, maybe more. Um, and I can't show them all because they're all like stacked up over there. But these are these, um, these Marvel legends figures. They're these retro mm. figures and they're super cool because they look like the stuff from the 70s and 80s. The, the yeah. costumes they have for these guys are the retro suits. It's not like the, you know, the 2020 version of Wolverine. Yeah. It's all this this old school stuff. Your story. You mean like where the the suit is like been rubbed in mud? Yeah. Like yeah. that 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 kind of thing. It's not I don't that, know. It's what you're it's saying. It's not that. It's not like because that's whatever. what they do nowadays in the superhero they, movies. They just take the costume and drag it through the mud, and make it real dark and dirty. I don't know. I don't know nothing about that. I don't know <laughs> it's about true. It. But in the comic Watch books, the movies, you'll see it. In the comic books, there's attention deficit disorder, and they change their outfits like every month. You know, they can never have anything consistent or or old school anymore. So these versions of these characters are like the classic versions from the 70s and 80s, where I came in where we all came in. That's so, pretty sweet, um, man. I didn't know they made super, those. Yeah, they're awesome. They, they've been around for just a couple of years and they've done a few, you know, like four waves or something of them. And um, I have, I've been getting crazy with it because they're like, first I was like, well, all I really need is Captain America and Wolverine. And oh, then and a week it later, never I'm stops like, there. No, it never <laughs> stops there. I'm going to need Spider-Man and I need Cyclops and I need Magneto and everybody else. So, well, I wasn't like, sure if you're like, Steve Martin in the jerk. Yes. Yeah. That's all I need. <laughs> I wasn't yeah. sure if you time traveled and went back to um, comic kingdom and then came back and showed yeah. us what you got. <laughs> yeah. That's what they look like. That's what they remind me of. That's why they're so appealing. So collecting cool stuff. That's my entry. All right. Well, for the next episode, I'm going to uh, have something on deck to show. Cool. Like I got, I got a handful of things like that for sure. Man, Absolutely. I collect some stuff, Aaron.
That's right. Don't don't count Greg out. Look I'm counting him in. I'm Look counting him in. I know. Look. Yeah, that's some stuff. You got some I stuff. It's all dark. It's back dark back. though. We can't really see. I it. know. Yeah. That's I'm not giving it away. That's fine. <laughs> it's all yes. planned. You've, you've seen enough value. of that one. That's right. You've seen yeah. enough of that one. Greg is very very professional. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was, well, I was just pointing. Well, well, don't 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 point. <laughs> All right, we're going to um, talk about a little bit of Voyager 3 news really quickly before we move on to the rest of the show. A couple really cool things coming up. First of all, we have a Black Friday sale happening where uh, we have some new stuff to offer and we have free shipping on all orders over $35 for the United States. Uh, so all the uh, contiguous U.S. orders over $35 get free shipping. We have a brand new shirt that we're calling the portal it's pretty fun pretty sci-fi and we're also going to be offering um some new york ninja vinyl uh the green uh colored one so uh that's been sold out so you'll have a chance to get some we have a limited amount that we're going to put up on the voyager 3 store v-o-y-a-g 3r store.com and uh another really awesome awesome thing is that the new york ninja comic book is finally out it's the sequel in comic book form, written and illustrated by Charles Forsman. So if you want to get a copy of it, you have to go to your local comic book shop and they should have some. And if you're in the Michigan area on Saturday, December 3rd, we're doing a free all ages concert at Comics and More in Madison Heights, Michigan. And showtime is 4 p.m. And we'll be there having our merch and Comics and More has a huge stack of New York Ninja comic books. We'll be signing stuff, hanging out, fist bumping, and most importantly, playing songs from all of our albums, including some songs from New York Ninja. So that's going to be a heck of a good time on Saturday, December 3rd. All right, on V3Cast, you know, we love to talk about sci-fi, horror, movies, films, books, all that kind of good stuff. So thought it was a cool idea to talk about what is your favorite book that made it to a film eventually? Sometimes they're on the mark. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes it depends. Did you read the book first or did you see the movie first? So it's a whole lot of variables there depending on uh, what order you've done things in. But um, Greg, how about you, man? Man, you threw me a softball this week. Okay. <laughs> this episode, everybody knows my answer, right? Do I even well, have to say it out loud? I, I'm pretty sure I've ever know. made. Yeah. What is it? We know. It's called Jaws. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And to answer Steve's question, I definitely saw the movie first because that, you know, I wasn't going to read a book that long at that age. Uh, so what I did was I went back to the book because um, I had heard that it was slightly different than the movie. You know, there's an affair between. Chief Brody's wife and Matt Hooper. And then, you know, the book is more tied in with like all the politics of the, the island. You know, there's a little bit of that in the movie, but the book focuses even a bit more on that. Hmm. So I don't, like, really like, I, I don't like this affair thing. I don't like that. <laughs> you don't like that? <laughs> no, I don't like it. Mean? That's given Aaron just the wrong vibes. No, so, I don't think we need that. We don't need that I, in a shark movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does make the story. I mean, it does add some drama. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it lots I'll give of drama. It that. Too much drama. But, uh, <laughs> too much. <laughs> too much drama. It should be about three guys killing a shark, and that's enough. That's what I'm already. saying. Right. God. Yeah. So Steve, when Steven Spielberg developed that, he, he's he shared Aaron's sentiment. I guess <laughs> he really boiled we're it not, down. We're not going down that route, man. <laughs> right. Woo. That's making so, uh, me very sad. Who was well, the author of sure. Jaws? Peter Benchley. Peter Benchley. Hmm. Do you know okay. he's in the movie? Oh, I, I didn't did know, know that. He has a cameo in the movie. He's the news reporter on the island when he, you know, on the beach when the news reporter's kind of saying, you know, you know, this dark cloud over Amity Island or whatever it is he yeah. says right, right there. That's Peter Benchley, the guy who That's wrote awesome. The book. Nice. Sweet. I love um, when they do stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, so I watched, I, I read the book, like, probably in high school, you know, I'm thinking, I found, you know, just went to the library, got it, and read it, and I didn't like it, just like Aaron said, I don't need all that other, you know, like, 
it, the movie kind of ruins it, right? Because the movie is just better. <laughs> That's my personal opinion. I think most people would probably agree. The movie is better than the book. Even the way like the shark is killed in the book is kind of like anticlimactic. So yeah, like you understand why Spielberg did what he did. Right. And uh, I mean, not to say that it's a bad book. And I even, I believe I even got this. I even listened to the audio book, like within the past, maybe five to 10 years. And I, and I was like, well, maybe I'll like it better if I listen to it one more time. Yeah. And it's just, it's just kind of, it just kind of, it's very, Spielberg took the best parts of the book and made them better. So sure. yeah. that's, that's my, that's my pick. And this was a softball. It was easy. <laughs> uh, you want to go next, Aaron? Sure. Um, for mine, I gave myself some sort of criteria. I said, um, it has to be something you read first because there's so many things that I've seen and then read the book later, you know, um, including like some of my favorite movies of all time. So I wanted to, um, challenge myself in that way. Um, the idea of reading the book first and then waiting for the movie because there's that anticipation, there's that anxiousness or anxiety or whatever about if they're going to mess, mess the the movie up, if they're going to, you know, ruin the book or whatever. So, um, I thought about a few different ones, but my pick is, is Watchmen. Um, because, um, you know, it was written in, it was put out in 1986, Alan Moore and, and, uh, David Gibbons, um, on art, Alan Moore on writing. And it was, it's, it was, it was such an epic story that it changed comic books. You know, I mean, that and the dark Knight uh, returns, in 86 they both changed comic books in, in in big ways i didn't read it then though i read it in about 96 um a friend of mine back at college recommended it and and uh he knew i like comic books and he's like you gotta you gotta get into the you gotta dive into the deep end with Watchmen, you know because i had read all the normal sort of mainstream comics and he's like you gotta read something really dark so i read it i loved it um it was it's huge it's a huge dense story and it was amazing but it made it really hard to film so they tried to film it they tried to make a movie out of watchmen like two or three or four times you know terry gilliam got pretty pretty close to doing it Hmm. um and uh he ended up saying himself that it's just unfilmable you know and uh um darren aronofsky was attached to make it uh years later and you know a few other people and it just kept falling apart so when they said that Zach, uh, Zach Snyder was going to, was going to make it, I, I said, well, I'll believe it when I see it. You know, I like, I liked him at the time. He had not done much. He had done Dawn of the Dead and, uh, and 300. He had done 300, uh, and I said, you know, he's cool. Um, but I, I don't believe he's going to uh, pull the movie off. So when I, I wouldn't believe it until I saw the trailer and I saw the trailer and it blew me away. And I started getting, you know, just a little bit of hope for it, but not, not through the roof hope, tempered <laughs> hope. And um, when I saw the movie, I thought it was pretty perfect. Um, what they changed, I had no problem with, um, you know, some big stuff, some little stuff. But I thought, you know, they can't change any page of the comic book. They can change things and adapt it for the movie, but they can't go backwards and and screw up a comic book that came out in 1986. So more than 20 years after the comic came out uh they finally put it on screen and i thought they did just a great job Uh, i thought it was a great cast uh rorschach stole the show uh but everybody was great all the characters had their moments and everything and and i thought Zack snyder really um just pulled it off just nailed it so um i remember really liking it but i never i never read the the book i just came at it cold and but it was it was well done yeah and it was Steve it went was right cool. to watch in the movie. Like That's right. notes. I'm not it was reading cool. the book. <laughs> <laughs> Why would I? Um, no, it was just a. <laughs> it, it went from being unfilmable to, I mean, I think, like I said, pretty perfect. And uh, I mean, not everybody's going to agree with that, but whatever. Well, I uh, I chose one. I didn't I didn't do any kind of thing where like I had to have not seen the film or read it first or whatever. I just kind of picked one that uh that really stuck out to me and um <clears throat> this one i saw the film first um actually i didn't even know that it was a book until later on uh and then i i never forget this it was uh, uh in college aaron we were living together and i went to the De- detroit public library 
and got the book and read it in one night. And I was like, this is so amazing. This is crazy good. But uh, Planet of the Apes um, by the French author uh, Pierre Boll. And uh, the book is amazing. It's very different from the film. Um, and, you know, some I, I would imagine probably some people who have seen the film and if they go read that, they might be like, what is going on? It's, it's so different. But to me, I was just open to anything Planet of the Apes. Um, and it, I didn't care of the differences. Like the the apes are like more advanced. They're more yeah. like um, uh, humans now, I guess, roughly, you yeah. know, maybe not exactly the same. But in the film, Planet of the Apes, it's very much more primitive uh, horseback, you know, that kind of thing. Um, a lot more superstitious or, uh, you know, bound to the faith, if you will, type of mm -hmm. type of a thing. So when, when, and by the way, the book came out in 1963 and the first Planet of the Apes film came out in 1968. So it wasn't that long before, right. you know, somebody realized, hey, this could be a really cool film and they started developing it. Um, but yeah, the book is amazing. It's pretty short read. I read it in one night. I don't even own it because the copy I read hopefully is still at the Detroit Public Library right now. Maybe one of these days I'll... I'll, I'll I'll check out the same book again and be like, hey, remember me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and read it again, man. But uh, right. yeah, and then obviously, um, and anything else with Planet of the Apes, the, the rest is history. There was, you know, the five original films that are all great. I know some people think that the last couple aren't that great, but I love every single one. Um, I even like the TV show. Um, wasn't a big fan of the Tim Burton one, but then the redos, you know, later on, you know, like recently, um, I've seen the first two and I still have yet to see the third one. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, wrapping that, uh, you know, newer trilogy up soon. Yeah, definitely watch it. It's just as good as the first two. So yeah, I actually just watched the first one, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, um, just two days ago uh, for the first time in a few years. Nice. And it's even better than I remember. I mean, I was like, oh, my God. This movie has not lost anything, so that's great. Yeah, so it held up. I, I, I like the development of of uh, when Caesar was put into the, um, you know, kind of the the animal jail, I guess you want to call that, yeah. um, and how he quickly, you know, made camaraderie with, with uh, especially that very smart orangutan. Yeah. You know, and they kind of like started communicating, and then he just built up their trust. And uh, when he defeated that one um, uh, that rocket other chimp, yeah, and and so so you know he was the head honcho of the of the bunch, and then everything yeah. just started rolling, man. And he 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 was he was uh, calling the shots. <laughs> Absolutely, totally, yeah. And that they um the original too, like you know, for for people of of our generation, like little kids like kind of stumbling upon that movie on like a Saturday afternoon and going, Oh my God, it's oh, the yeah. coolest thing ever. Oh you yeah. Know? Yeah. And, I uh, still remember the first time I saw it and I'll never forget it. It was unbelievable. Yeah. And I, I rented that book from the library too, probably a month after you did. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's great book and, and a <clears throat> great series and, you know, a cool book for a, for a, like a sort of a, I think we were teenagers to read, yeah. um, because it wasn't too long, you know. Like as 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 younger kids, I did probably didn't want to read anything too long back then, you know. So. Right, exactly. Like we, we weren't about to jump into the stand or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> This is a, a short mailbag, short and sweet. Blog jammer <laughs> last last time we talked about the uh, twenty year anniversary of a bunch of movies, and he pointed out Jason X, which is a great one. Oh yeah, um, we saw it at the theater. I remember it vividly. Yeah. So that was cool. That was uh, you know, them just throwing the rule book out the window for <laughs> Friday the Thirteenth. By the way. Yeah. It has one of the most creative kills in any Jason movie. Which one is that? Yeah, you got to remind me of that one. Where he like pushes her head down into the the that liquid that like freezes her face instantly and then he just smashes her entire uh, head into like a million pieces on the edge of the desk. <laughs> nice. You know, in hindsight now because I forgot about that. I saw it one time at the theater 
originally. Now that's like a Mortal Kombat inspiration, if you ask me. Yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> well, good. it's, it's cool. Like, it's cry- good. like a like a cryogenic liquid or something. You like yeah, for sure. Having it and it, and it and the the shot is like from inside the sink up at her face, and you see it all like crystallized. Nice. Yeah. Then he just yanks her head out and smashes it on the desk. And it nice. shatters. Great. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is B.L. Fisher talked about his most disappointing follow-up to a classic album. And he pointed out a, a good one, uh, the transition from And Justice for All to the Black Album, which, you know, in my opinion, the Black Album isn't even bad. I like it. But compared to And Justice for All, right. right. Yeah, it's I different. Mean, compared to well, And Justice it- for All, it's a it's a it's such a monumental shift and and you know an entire <clears throat> generation of metallica fans were pretty much like kind of left in the dark um coming from you know their their first four albums so such a solid sort of line through all of them and then the black album is just like a kind of the rug on uh, pulled out from under you you know because it was so drastically different and um streamlined and stripped down and and very processed and um <clears throat> You know, so yeah, I said uh, it in the comments. Uh, Skid Row put out a heavier record that year, <laughs> right? Well, that's right. right. Slave to the Grind, right? Yeah, Slave to the Grind was heavier than the Black Album. Yeah, yeah. And then because of the Black, like the Black Album sent these waves through the whole metal, the whole metal community. Because then it was so commercially successful and so um, kind of, you know the edge was taken off that all these other bands were like, we got to do something like that if we want to sell. So, so many bands like watered their sound down and wanted to get on the radio. And yeah, it was kind of those that was felt for, for, for years before kind of uh, metal came back sort of focused, you know? Yeah. I'm with you though. Like when you listen to the black album now, it's actually pretty good because I saw how shitty Metallica could get. They, yeah, they, right. They, that's right. So be careful what you wish for. <laughs> they kind of continued to prove to me how bad they could get. Yeah, you know, and you know, the Black Album in retrospect is actually not that bad. That's true. Yeah. What's up, Greg? Uh, Steve, what what do you have? Our buddy Tim, Tim James, who helps us out sometimes and uh, <clears throat> comes to shows and hangs out sometimes. He had an in person mailbag. I, I saw him a couple weeks ago, and and he was asking about uh, New York Ninja and the recording kind of in the writing uh and and the question was can can we play new york ninja live like the whole album and i, I told him that uh i would say probably like 95 percent of it i think can be performed live without leaving out too much because when i was coming up with the like uh you know structures that that i would email to you guys right I kept that in my in my mind as much as possible. Like, hey, I I might have to play some of these songs, so I can't have like you know five synth parts going, um, right? Because I can't physically play that. Um, so between like an arpeggio going, and maybe the sequencer going, and then I have two hands after that, um, everything is pretty much playable. Um, and there, there's a few exceptions where the need to have it sound a certain way outweighed me making sure that if we choose to play song X live, we can. So most of it, yes, can be played live. And there's a few here and there. I don't even know which ones I would have to like, like sit down and listen to it. But uh, yeah. most of it was, was designed to be able to be played live. Like all of our songs, you know, I still wanted to keep that motivation. I know we all did. Um, yeah. So there's, there's just a couple slivers where it needed to have that part. And I might not be able to physically have another arm to play that part. So you know whatever but yeah most of it uh is uh playable (laughs) liveable playable but it would take us oh a long time to practice that (laughs) like to play all 30 in a row yeah you know uh, an hour and 15 minutes it would take a lot of practice but it is playable it is yeah and and you know every two three weeks or every month we add uh, another track like we just added uh roller ninja to the set so that's a little spoiler for you um we'll be playing that song next time anybody sees us live if anybody recalls we did a deep dive uh into our very first release which was the victory in the battle chamber seven inch now we're going to bring you another deep dive into our first full-length record which was released in 2015 
It's called Doom Fortress. Anybody have any uh, particular fun memories from those sessions? I know mine was uh, being at the Temper Mill in particular because I absolutely love that studio. And, yeah. uh, you know, all the vintage gear. We recorded that on a Harrison 32 input console um, that went right to a uh, Sony MCI 24 track tape machine. And so that was a highlight for me. I love that gear. I love being around that stuff. So uh, that's how that album was recorded. Yeah. Um, I have a, some notes like in order of songs. Um, I remember, uh, and I, so a lot of it's little moments. I, I, and Summoning the Forgotten Ones, one of the earliest songs we ever wrote, probably like the third song we ever wrote. And uh, I always love every time I listen to that song till, till, till now, um, in the verse when you go, boom, boom, boom. You do oh that yeah weird right ass little swing like yeah i don't know it sounds like a, a sickle coming and chopping somebody's head off <laughs> um i don't that even know fun. what you do but i like it right 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 uh for the technicalness i just uh add a uh a, a lfo uh to mm. the filter so it just kind of makes it start to freak out and and and, and waver and wobble and when yeah. that's already using like an FM synthesis, which is like metallic y sounding, is a simple way to describe that kind of sound because it's a bell. So it's yeah. got that FM synthesis, which is like a later uh advancement in in uh in synthesis. Uh, mm -hmm. we have like more a little bit more real sounds, uh like the DX7 is a great example. The Yamaha DX7 is a great example of when FM synthesis came in. Hell yeah. Now, just kind of just kind of mess with that and, and go nuts, you know. <laughs> love it. I love it. Yeah, everything Steve said, we love it. <laughs> yeah, don't ask the synth and production nerd uh how a sound was made because I would literally mm. tell you. <laughs> Talk to me, baby. Tell me about Steve, those technical. Steve will do a whole episode on how that sound was made. <laughs> do you guys have any notes for summoning? Oh yeah. Um I didn't do it by song. Okay. I, I I do, I do for that, that one. It's that exact part, as a matter of fact. So the bell part is yeah. uh, pretty cool because when we, the first day we started tracking the drums, uh, you know, you, you always walk around the temper mill and see what kind of fun stuff is laying around because there's always awesome stuff laying around. And, and I saw this, uh, those little toy pianos. Yes. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to layer the, this toy piano with the part yeah. that I play normally and obviously live. That's not there, but it doesn't need to be live. Right, but, but I added that to the yeah. recording, and then they're blended together, and so you can't, you know, it sounds like one sound, but it's got that extra chaoticness, and it's a little bit out of tune because it's a little like bit out of tune. Piano, right? it's it's wonderful. Yeah, and it's like it's got no sustain. It's just like ting ting ting. Yeah, it's very and attacking. you played it, and and we, that was perfect. That that would have never happened anywhere else. You know, you just found it. You're like, hey. Here we go. And this little thing is like this big. Yeah, it's this you little know, toy like, thing. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna put a mic on this thing. That was it. Yeah. yeah. That was awesome. Huh. I Very almost forgot stuff. about that. Oh, and Greg, you played your awesome uh black DW kit. I remember I saw some photos a couple of days ago. I, I looked back to photos and that's the kit that was mic'd up in there. Well, that's the point I was gonna make about Doom For the transition from the EP to Doom Fortress was that um that that's the first record where I actually played my drums. Yeah. Um on Victory of Battle Chamber we used uh the studio drums. Yeah, which I think are a Slingerlin kit, right? I, I think. It's either Slingerlin or Ludwig, but it's blue sparkle. Yeah. I thought it was Ludwig. We got a picture. We got pictures of it. I don't know. Yeah. It, might be a it, it, it could be either one, uh, but the same era. Like I was, I want to say it's like fifties or sixties era. Yeah. And um, that, we but talked that about this before, but we, we set up the, that kit with the baffles. So it was very dead and contained sounding. Yeah. We did not do that for doom fortress yeah. more, more yeah, studio D, rock drums. Yeah. The DW kit is definitely a, a different beast. It's like a 24 inch kick with 13 and 18 toms you know oh, the, so it's just the like floor tom on that sizes. kit is monstrous yeah. <laughs> yes. it's like a kick drum the thing's ridiculous yeah so, so awesome for uh one's true intentions you know i did i did like a different tuning for that because when i was when you had sent over the initial uh you know tune the, the initial idea for the song and i'm sitting in this room actually um <laughs> 
uh, coming up with the guitar part for it that I heard in my head, but it was a little hard to play. So I said, well, I'm going to cheat. So I, I <laughs> untuned two of the strings and I don't even remember what I tuned them to. I, I'd have to find it. And, uh, but I always just kind of go by ear and it made it easier to play and more functional. So yeah. that, uh, is, I don't do that all the time. Cause that would be a pain in the ass to be tuning guitars all the time. Um, I did that for that one. And then, and then what I like about that song, at least for guitar is, uh, in the solo, I'm like climbing up to right at the end of the solo, I'm bending, bending, bending the shit out of the string and it breaks and you can hear it break. And we kept it. We, of course, that's the, the take we used and kept it in the song. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like, like, you know, like, <clears throat> like a tornado or something in my mind, like, because we put some effects on it, I can't remember what it was. That that string breaking, of course, makes the solo to in my mind. You know, right? For me, no, so. for sure, man. It's like the um, triumphant uh, ending for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'm trying to think of, uh, yeah, I remember we were doing a handful of takes on, of that solo beforehand. It's probably what wore out the string, but we were kind of like, oh kind of going like okay, we like that part. They, oh, do, oh yeah, do that part again, right? And then that final take, it was like all the best bits that, that you were coming up with and you just played it straight through and then boom, that string. Man, I, yeah. I remember like kind of carving through the, the jungle, you know, okay, yeah. here, go down this road, boom, boom, boom. And then you came up with the perfect combo of stuff. It was, it was fun. Deal. That was great. You, I think every guitarist wants to have a <clears throat> broken string on recording yeah because uh it's it's real man it's real that's right that's right it's not a plug-in this is real no. <laughs> <laughs> oh man what else about that song oh oh <clears throat> one of my favorite things it's not technically uh you know mind-blowing as far as like if somebody would you know talk about how fast somebody can play or, or or whatever it's but it's very simple but it's the first time you hit a chord in the whole song when it kind of kicks in um and the chord is just so monstrous um so I, I i always love that chord when it hits solidly um after it kicks it kicks in uh after the kind of yeah. breakdown part I've, i is always it? love that i think robert fripp would be uh pleased to hear that aaron like just created some tuning on his guitar to make it easier. That's right. <laughs> right. His, his ears would perk up. Is that the new standard tuning? Which, which, which tuning is it? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Talk to me about this tuning, Aaron. <laughs> yeah. Fine. I do want to bring that back into the set because I, I, I really like that song and we haven't played that in, in a handful of years because we keep putting out new records and there's only yeah. so much time in the set, which is, goes back to the yeah, new Ninja songs, question <laughs> from earlier. We got a lot of songs. Yes, we got indeed. plenty. Plenty of songs. Oh, yeah. And then how does side one finish? I'm talking about the vinyl version, of course. There's only got, six um, songs on Doom Fortress. Doom Fortress Escape. And that's a nice, solid one. You know, it comes in with no intro, no lead in or anything. It's just all three of us, bam. And I like that. Um, and that one, as far as guitar, I got to... <laughs> I got to do the Gojira pick drag in that song, <laughs> which I, for years, I didn't know how they did it. I couldn't understand it to make that like weird, you know, shriek sound. And uh, it sounded so cool. And I thought it had to be the hardest thing to do in the world. And then I saw them live and I watched every time they did that, I watched that they weren't doing anything fancy. They were, oh. their, their, their hand, their right hand wasn't moving anywhere, you know, that I couldn't, it wasn't anything out of reach. So I finally realized, oh my God, they're just dragging their pick across the string. It's the easiest thing to do, right, but right. it sounds like it would be so complicated. So I was like, well, I got to do that in a song. So, uh, <laughs> so probably the, the week I figured out how Gojira does it, I uh, incorporated it into the writing of um, Doom Fortress Escape. And I'm proud of That's that. That's awesome. Huh. Yeah. See, inspiration um, floating around everywhere and we didn't even know it. Well, yep. I mean, you knew it. I didn't know it. <laughs> and uh, I like also how at the end of that one, you kind of, you slow it down and, and slowly uh, kind of make, make it chaotic. And, oh, um, right. Yeah. Like pitch it down. 
Yeah. And add delay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That was that, uh, I still have it, but it's that Moger Foger, uh, the white delay pedal. Um, that's what I used on yeah. that one. Big for sure. boxy yeah. delay, right? Yeah. 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 It's, it's like, but it's so nice. Like I would never take it out and put it on the floor. It's just, it's too nice for that. It's like, it's like furniture. <laughs> right, got the nice you, might sides. To, <laughs> you might have to put it on the floor you never know you never what know. kind of project you might end up using it for that's true that's true you, you got know. all kinds of tools and and, and weapons so you never know what, yeah. what you have to grab inside the first song on side two that's in the hands of the computers yes the main thing i have the note i have about that is just the title um you know like Go ahead, Steve. Where where's that title come from? It it, it ties into what we've yeah, been talking it does. About. It ties into what we were talking about earlier. Um, it's a it's a it's a line that uh, Charlton Heston's character Taylor says at the very beginning of the original Planet of the Apes film, when it's kind of the shot of the inside the ship, and he's kind of narrating what's going on. I think it's even before he's on screen. I'm pretty sure. Um, and he says, "Now we're in the hands of the computers because they go into like hypersleep and this autopilot for the ship." Um, yep. so th- I thought that was a really cool line. I've always liked that line for years and years and years. So there was the time to finally pluck it and use it for a song title. <laughs> yeah. What I like about that one is it's like very minimal and, yep. yeah. you know, on purpose. I remember talking about how, you know, I really like that. You know, I like a lot of that minimal ambient, like droney sort of electronic music. I've always liked that stuff. And, so like when we had that one, I, I was like pretty adamant, like, I don't want to do too much with it. You know what I mean? I want it to yeah. just stay like this sort of like thing that just keeps kind of going, you know? Right. And, yeah. uh, and it's a perfect break too, because I mean, we just talked about, uh, Doom yeah, Fortress, Doom Fortress Escape. Escape. So like the, it was the perfect, like come down from that. You know what I mean? Cause you, yeah. you can't do too much of that. And, and it really, you know, adds some depth, I think to, you know, what we offer as a band, you know, we don't want to like overstay your welcome too much in any of like the different things that we try to do. <laughs> so yeah. it's yeah, good it's always for fun variation and mixing it up and, you know, not always having to be like so over the top and like Compl- complicated. Right. Just really got the point across and what we were trying to achieve yeah. without doing overthinking it kind of thing, you know, very, very true. Um, All right. What's we, next? What's the next track? <clears throat> We got El Guanto Nero. First and, video. You know, that's our video, and that was a lot of fun. Um, and, you know, as years go by, it's easier to say, <laughs> like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, I was kind of going for an Alan Parsons project, um, um, Serious Eye in the Sky, you know, the intro of Serious. Uh, Everybody knows that it's the 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 uh, the Lakers used to come out to it, right? The Lakers. Oh the yeah, Bulls. yeah, yeah. Um, shoot, I don't know which team, but I definitely I think it was know the that Lakers. Sound. And it's it's like just such an iconic. It's actually synth, but for years I thought it was guitar. It sounds like guitar to me. Yeah, it's a very kind um, of a plucky, yeah, uh, patch. Yeah. And so when I when I was when you you'd sent your your parts over for that song, and I heard what you were doing in my mind went, well, he's playing these long notes, long drawn out notes. I'm going to play something that's quick notes to counteract that. So we won't be playing the same thing. And, um, and then I came up with this like delay, you know, loop riff. And I was like, kind of sounds like Alan Parsons project. And that's a good thing. So we'll stick with it. Um, <laughs> <There you go. laughs> the other thing I'll say about Il Guanto Nero is this, this is the first of many songs that are, a, a tip of the hat to uh italian giallo oh. films right yep that was oh, our yeah. first italian title steve likes to come I, up with I, yeah so we, we kind of, we, yeah we try to sneak an italian <laughs> title into almost every record i think except right. for maybe new york ninja right it, and the, you know the thing about it is and that's cool to do that but i'm a little disappointed steve as far as the italian thing goes that you haven't even seen The Godfather. <laughs> what? That's a good Come point. On, I've seen yeah. so many other Italian films, but yes, not that one. You're You've right. seen yeah, all the Giallos, Dario Argeno, and Fulci, and not, you know, not The Godfather. Right. 
Yeah, <laughs> so, we learned that about Steve prior to the podcast starting. So yeah. that's right. Here's a. I don't think we were on the air yet. When we learned that. I, I, I got to get on that. And the thing is, I bought them on Blu-ray because I know that I'm gonna oh watch gosh, them. She has them on so Blu-ray. <laughs> they're ready to go when Dude. I have some time. All You're right, killing your cousin. You're killing. Now's your the moment. I'm issuing a Cam Floyd challenge right <laughs> now. Go. Oh to yeah. You. I don't fucking, I don't care if it's tomorrow or two months from now. <laughs> no, two months is too long. Right. You've that's got too to long. watch The Godfather. Right. Get on it. That's right. It's only least... three hours long. The last one on the album, Lord of Doom Fortress. I love that song. The, the only, like as far as behind the scenes stuff that nobody would probably ever know is that we, we were, since we were doing the stuff on vinyl, physical vinyl, you know, before digital, like we were thinking about vinyl first and um, we were running out of time on the album. So that song had to be sort of truncated. If we had had all the time in the world, that song would have been probably a, a minute or two longer. Right. How long do we play it live? More solo, probably at the end. There's a solo. I think and... everybody I think everybody wants more solo at the end. <laughs> I think that's the number one thing we've heard <laughs> for good reason. There's... Yeah, I remember there's reading a, a comment one time or an email or something where somebody was like, please tell me there's like enough another mix where it doesn't fade out. And we're it's like, like no, a three no, minute, that, three that's minute outro. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, and we have a longer intro for that song live too. So that's the thing, you know, come to shows and you'll get to see that song uh, and hear it in its entirety. Um, but that was, I think, um, it, but it was an earlier example of the rule of three when did we do it in the intro? We don't do the intro four times when we all kick in. We we do it three times instead of four. So um, we do that you know, whenever we feel like it in That's our songs. Right. And uh, yeah, that was cool. It comes up once in a while. And uh, I think probably my favorite part of of that song, well, it's, it's kind of got different movements because like the ending is very fun where like, kind of like the horns bring in that last part and then it kicks in and then there's a guitar solo. But I would say that the middle part is very sinister. Uh, yeah. you know, obviously, being scored for this fictitious Lord of Doom Fortress, you kind of want to give him a uh, menacing theme, right? But the this intro, guy? yeah, the yeah, intro, though, is sort of not like that either. So it's got like kind of three distinct movements in there. So right. that's kind of fun. Um, I mean, I, all songs have parts, but these like kind of feel more separated to me, like almost like like, like I say, like movements. So it's, it's yeah. cool, and and the ending one uh, kind of is like redemption to me. It's kind of right. kind of cool, you know, and it hits. Uh, it's kind of you know halftime beat. It's fun and uh, yep. heavy, heavy. You know, like you'd imagine, like if it's the book or the the film, uh, some heavy shits happening. You know, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and I liked um, when we were writing that song. We were like, "Hey, why don't we bring in the intro riff for Doom Fortress Escape? Right. Bring it into this song." And that was the first time we had um, started experimenting with themes and recurring themes in the album. And so I think that's why we ended up calling that song "Lord of Doom Fortress." It had a different title at first, and then we we wanted to connect those two songs, and then that ended up making us call the whole album doom fortress you know yeah, so yeah so that was kind of it all yeah that was crucial okay so since we're talking about doom fortress let's go over those uh formats really quickly because that's a fun part of it too to you know like yeah. uh not only the songs and maybe some of the production and some of the behind the scenes uh mojo and thought process but it was on it was done on vinyl and on cd and on cassette uh, so we did a very limited edition uh, Voyager 3 gold record, um, which was sold out very fast because I think a lot of people were picking up, you know, the, the kind of vibe of the Voyager spacecraft and how they have gold records yep. on them. Um, so that was sold out pretty quickly. And then uh, oh, we did black as well. Um, yeah, I mean, because when Scotty purple. did the second pressing of it, I know we did that translucent purple. I want to mention the the insanely awesome album cover by Slasher Dave. Yes, um, he did a masterful job on that one. He knocked it out of the park, and that 
you know, he did our seven inch too. So we were, we, we had high expectations for our full length album and he just like, just nailed it. Yeah. Um, I was walking through the Vegas airport when I got his text with that picture in there and I'm like, we're, we're done. <laughs> we're done. We got we're it. Done. <laughs> and I keep that, uh, I have a, a button of it, a square button of it on my <clears throat> jean jacket, my jean jacket that, uh, it's the only button I have on it right now. It's just doom fortress. So yeah, everybody can look at, look at my button with envy. Cool. Yeah. Well, we hope everybody has enjoyed this 20th episode of v3 cast we've been doing this for one year we're voyager three we're a band we also do a podcast so if you've had fun and if you like these kind of topics go ahead and smash the like button and subscribe and check us out on voyag3r.com we post our shows we post when we have a new v3 cast up and we have a store uh voyag3r store.com and until next time, this has been V3Cast.